Greetings from the CM Russell Museum, and welcome to another installment of the 2020 Art in Action Artist Showcase. I'm Executive Director Tom Figarelli. Given the impacts of the coronavirus and our need to postpone our annual Russell exhibition and sale, as well as a major component of it, Art in Action, we've had to take a different uh, approach to allow you to engage with artists and connect with uh, Western art, with our institution, and just feel like you're part of a, a bigger community. Um, art in Action, which many of you know, is an exciting variation of a traditional quick draw, where nationally known artists have several hours to finish a piece of art while they interact with guests. Now, it's really difficult for us to recreate the opportunity for uh, seeing an artist work uh, on their piece live, obviously. But what we're trying to recreate here is that conversation, the dialogue, the interaction that otherwise you'd miss out on and which many patrons say is the highlight for them of Art Week in Great Falls. Art in Action is sponsored by DA Davidson Companies, uh, who also underwrite all of our education programming at the CM Russell Museum. We're very grateful for their support as they help us advance the art and soul of the American West. I'm joined today by artist Greg Kelsey. Greg, thanks for joining us. Good morning, how are you doing? Uh, doing tremendous, doing tremendous. Uh, looks like you're hard at work there. Working on an elk. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Greg, if people are wondering, you know, if everything going on in this world, how, how are you doing? How are you faring? Faring well. Doing good. Um, staying busy with, uh, in the cool parts of the day, we go outside and work and irrigate, work cows and horses, and in the hot part of the day, shade up and and try to get after some sculpting or some painting and hanging out with the family, keeping it like a regular day. <laughs> good for you. Routine is is key, right? It's key. This is uh, we have a, a little boy, Wilder is his name, and and he's uh, he's gonna figure out a little. We're not gonna do total homeschool with him, but we're gonna do a hybrid system with him with a little private school that we're gonna try out this year, and it's three days a week and. Um, the rest of it will be up to us, and it'll be our second child to, to do a homeschool with. So we've done that before too, and um, kind of fits our it fits our program pretty well and how we live. Well, good for you. I mean, no doubt your kids can be out and about and, and see livestock and wildlife and see you work, and there's a lot of education in that. Yeah, and there's a lot of get-together stuff we still do with other, you know, uh, cow and horse people around and um, working each other's pastures and helping each other out and doing the neighborly trade deal. Well, good for you guys. Good for you. I'm glad you, you're, you're enduring these times. Now, Greg, you know, art in action, you're no stranger to it. You're no stranger to quick finishes um, and, and that type of event where you're trying to work on a piece, you're trying to have conversation, uh, you're reconnecting with old friends, building some new relationships. Uh, tell us, Greg, why that kind of format fits for you. You know, I didn't really ever know any different than, than that format. Of the Russell, when I started it almost 20 years ago, that was the first quick draw I'd ever done. And um, I'd never even been around. I wasn't around a lot of that. I'd been in a gallery atmosphere. And in college, I mean, it's pretty brutal to be sculpting in front of your other classmates or doing it. <laughs> right. We, we would do peer critiques all the time, you know. So um, I was excited for it to see what it was like in that level with the – with a buying crowd watching, you know, with a very interested crowd that's not, it's not so academic. It's, um, there's a lot of real, uh, just they're there for the straight collecting version of, of, you know, appreciation of the art, not the, you know, not another artist's view of it. So that was something that took me by surprise how much more I would like that atmosphere. I still crave artists to critique my work. That's something that, that I've always liked and, and, and wanted to have happen and I did a lot of that in the early beginnings with with great artists like TD Kelsey you know I'd I'd run up and grab those guys by the shoulder and hey man come over here and beat me up on my piece and <laughs> and then to see in it and to see their their feedback to you also while you're producing and creating in front of them is uh it's a it's it's a greater high than the then the feeling of the performance art part, you know, like you're starting to have to turn this into a performance now. Um, that takes a total backseat feeling to, to you don't even worry about that, you know, and that's what a lot of people pressure up over is that they have to do that in front of people. 
for me, it was the, the plus sides of all the feedback that you get throughout the process is it's just something that you get to craving and I've not missed one since I started doing them um, every year. So it's good that y'all are still doing it this year because this will this will be 19, I think, this one. Yeah, well, you know, we don't want to miss a beat with them because they're, they're really a, a patron favorite. I mean, uh, year in, year out, people just talk about how much they love art in action. And it's because of you. Uh, it's because of, our, of, of artists like you who bring their talent, their personality, the stories um, together with, with good friends you've made over the years. You know, as you're visiting with someone, uh, Greg, and they give you some feedback, um, whether it's intentional feedback, uh, so some constructive feedback, or maybe it's just an observation, do you make on-the-spot adjustments based off of some of the things that you're hearing, or do you stay just fairly focused on whatever plan you formulated going in? <laughs> I like to fly by the seat of my pants on that deal, and sometimes I'll go in with a piece that's really far along, and sometimes I'll start one from scratch a couple years ago. Um, I mean, every year is different, but uh, Brent Cotton come up there and he was going to be a spectator that year and, and uh, take the day off, right? And so he comes up to me and he says, <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to do some old longhorn again or something? I said, well, if I was you, what would I do? Some old fly fisherman again or something? I said, matter of fact, since you're not, you're going to be, since you're not producing today, you're going to be my model today. Stand there and I want to make this longhorn into a fly fisherman so i did it right there and, <laughs> and went, wow that's a bold move yeah i just went to you know and put it in the spirit of what the peak what the event is about and it's about being able to do a quick draw and sometimes we i mean especially in this medium it doesn't move that fast um and i really do envy those that start from scratch and, and produce a sellable collectible signable piece of artwork in that time period but uh just to go in there with a strict program it's i've done it and i've done it maybe half the time probably where i where i didn't change uh much um but to but got feedback um from from viewers you know from live bidders or fixing to be live bidders on the piece and i was able to get feedback and see what the what the viewing public buying public thought of the idea in action and that's a pretty priceless moment too for an artist to get to especially young artists whenever you're you're not really uh i didn't really know the market whenever i first got in there i was just producing what i felt like i liked you know and what i wanted and what my life was representing and how that felt came through my filter and to get to have that interaction with with the buyer is it's especially at a, as a young artist it was that was a huge, huge learning curve for me. Well, I, so you know, was to get the feedback, you know, and then and then to let that just go through the filter too. Yeah, no, no doubt, and that feedback's got to be priceless. I mean, because uh, in, in what other avenue or venue do you get that immediate reaction? Um, and and then you know you can um, take it in and do with it what you want. Um, you know, speaking of do with them what you want, what, what are you working on here? I certainly see a bull elk, but can you tell us about this guy? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, I've yet to really put a title on him yet, but like in the quick draw, sometimes my, my, you know, guys that are coming up there and talking to me and ladies and gentlemen be sitting there asking me questions. And then before you know, the next question is what's it going to be titled and And then we come up with one together or, I start making a list of everybody that comes by and seeing what they are. And we come up with one. Sometimes popularity wins out. Sometimes my, <laughs> my choice. <laughs> Your oh, but, call. Yeah. But uh, we have a lot of fun with it. And this one needs to have a title too, but this is an elk ascending down. I'm thinking of calling it uh, love and war. And uh, he's coming down with, uh, it's all about their approach and their attitude and, what you want to convey in the piece, you know, and his body and gesture is going to say that what is doing is what he is doing is bugling down here, talking to somebody on his way down to the, to the park at the bottom. And, uh, it's a similar approach to love and war for him, you know, on his descent down off the mountain there. And that's the, what I was wanting to convey on this guy is how he, uh, What's he going to be doing with his with his next few minutes? You know, <laughs> right? No, that's appropriate title because he has very two two vastly different uh, ends of the spectrum that he could select there. 
right. no, I think that's very apropos. And it's a good size piece, obviously. I mean, we get a sense of the, the, uh, the scope of it as you stand next to it. Yeah, it's a uh, half life size. Um, if you were to go off of scale, it's uh, so that's a, you know, an eight inch head there. And a bull elk's head's about 16 inches on his skull. So that's how I figure out the scale and go off the bones, the bone structure of one and half that down. And that's my scale. So off as you, you approach some of your work, Greg, and you're, you know, selecting, you know, obviously the subject, the scale, the position, uh, you know, walk us through, if you will, that process. How do you make some of those decisions? How do you move from an idea um, to a final product? Well, some ideas, they don't deserve a big, big takeover a room, you know, but they might do what they need to do in a small cubby space or, or a small edge of a desk or something. But when you're thinking about wanting to control the side of a mantle off of a chimney or a big, a big area that's, that's usually going to have a big wall with it too, or a big room, then that's where I start thinking about the scale of what I want to do. And, and if I, like this, if I was doing it, I was going to have an elk and I wanted to have him, I wanted to have him in that position where he could be descending and you could put him up high and he would still be interacting with the room, you know? And so, um, and when I mean high, I mean up above waist high, if you wanted to, you could put him up there and he would still be interactive with you and not be uh, off on his own deal, you know, and not be a part. I want him to feel balanced in the room to where they, they're not going to be not seen or, or felt or understood for what they're supposed to be. Some fucking horse pieces don't have to be any bigger than that. And they're going to come across as, as some ownership of their space. This guy needed to be this size to be where I think that he should be placed and do what he's supposed to do. Um, I wanted him to have this, at least a half life presence. I'd like to take him life size or bigger. And um, some pieces just want to be big. And when you, and, it, and a lot of it has to do with the composition. Um, some big objects are, to me, it's not who and what this piece is. It's the shapes that are there and the shapes that aren't there. This, this is negative space. Those shapes mean a lot and how big they are and if they should happen. And if you wanted to clog them up to make them not happen, how, I mean, how much mass is that going to change the piece? There's a lot to think about in a sculpture that will make your mind melt down until you just jump in and bail in on it. And you think that I should have this piece. I need a piece this size you know, to cover up this much space. And that's way, it's way easier to keep it basic because once you start getting into the rest of it, this conversation can go on for days. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, well, you know, all this, because there's so much of these extra spaces here that, that change when you make them only this big, you know, that's, that's really not a problem when it's that big, you know, but when you get them back to, up to half life or life size, you just expounded a problem that's going to be, you know, exponential compared to what it was when it was little. Well, and I think what you're bringing up for me is a, a certain problem of physics, right? I mean, when you're sculpting, you have to be conscious about balance, right? I can only imagine that you have to have a sense of kind of structural engineering to it. And especially as you're noting with a bigger piece where you have maybe more open space, how do you ensure that, um, you know, it, it maintains a, a certain you know, physical balance, but then also, you know, as the eye catches it, I can imagine you want to be able to tell a story too and take the visitor to a certain part of the sculpture. Is that, is that relevant for what you work on? Yes. And I mean, the geometric shapes of what is not there are as powerful as this outside physical form line. Okay. Mm, interesting. Right here that is, that, that messes up a lot of, makes a lot of bad sculpture or good sculpture is what is not there and how you deal with those those open windows is what those are called and, and are they helping or hurting your piece um and from what angle you walk around this piece and it's a different piece um and those are different looking you know that's a now a different kind of a window so it's got to be it's it is a mind melter this is a hard thing about sculpture that makes it um 
where you keep it easy and I keep it down to geometric shapes that make me feel if I want this thing going downhill, then I'm going to make these thing these these windows here are going to have angles that are pushing down a hill like like if you were pushing down a hill, just like my arms just did. I want that line and that ang that window in there that's not there. That negative space needs to be telling that same story, even though there's nothing there. And that's getting into, I don't know, a spirit of a piece of what you're doing with it. And some, some pieces, mine included, those are missed opportunities as what Lincoln Fox would say. He would say those are missed opportunities um, when, you, when you go ahead and cast it. Um, you know, Ed Froughton, another hero sculptor of mine, that would really get in your head about that stuff would, would tell you, you know, that once it's in bronze, it's never, it's never not a part of history again. You know, those things last forever. And <laughs> you, yeah, that's right. That's right. You just messed up forever. And that, that could hold a lot of people back too, but I don't know. Messing up well, can be a bad habit, I guess. And certainly, you know, if you're if you're uh, interacting with someone, a buyer or a collector, uh, someone who's just appreciating your art, and they're intimately familiar with how an elk moves down a hill, they know how livestock cross over rocks, they're going to understand some of the nuances. And uh, so to be able to take that and relate that into a bronze in a way that will fit a natural uh, movement but to do that in a way that makes sense for the shape and complexity of what you're working on, it feels like that's got to be a, a challenge, but a balance that you're probably always trying to maintain. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's, you can overthink it and, and you, and there is so much to think about it. The best thing to do is start letting, letting the work go, accomplish what you want. If you want to feel like it's falling down, then sculpt it falling down. Um, it's uh, it's necessary to run a pole of everything that you sculpt. It's your job as an artist to make it look like it doesn't have a pole run up it. And there's um, that won't be there in the in the bronze, of course. But you have to have that there because this stuff can't structurally hold itself together. You know. That's sure, it. sure. But in the metal, it will. But in the clay, it doesn't. So don't be so willing to conform. And don't let that, what you're supposed to do, hold you back from getting started. You are, I'll figure it out because can't, you can tell a lot of stories and, and you don't have to tell the whole story and your eye will figure it out. Um, you don't have to continue the line before your eye figures out that that line keeps going, you know? So there's a lot that'll happen in, in your learning curve and what you could overthink once you get it into the physical form, just you'll start seeing it. I'm lucky that like people ask me, how do you see your piece before it's done before you're ever even started? It usually is done before I ever started. And it goes around in my brain the way, I don't know, like a like you would see on a computer screen of a 3D version of what a skull looks like. You know, it's that's what it looks like in my brain moving around in there. It's like I can see all the way around the skull. I just don't see the eye sockets and the nose and the mouth. I don't I see all the way around it and a lot of that is from really studying your subject matter and getting to know it in a way that it's not so easy to lie to yourself either you know and here you are trying to figure out and, and get people to believe your story in the physical form your artwork but you don't really understand your subject matter well enough to be able to do it without so much extra reference, which now has killed a lot of what the spirit and creativity would be in your piece. So the more you can know about it and run it through your filter, I think that there's, as far as the process goes, that for me works the best to where I feel like I like the taste of that coming out of that filter than I do ever. I'm really too strict on, overthinking it and you being really too strict on my on my uh on my reference material sure yeah no I, I, there's a little bit of a genuine quality to it um that you're just letting your instinct and your uh you know feel for the work and the subject take hold i mean that makes sense yeah and let let your life 
your your work be from from life more than than a, a two dimensional reference, you know. Um, that way you're, you're all the way around that animal all the time. Even if you're doing two dimensional work and you're painting, I like to work from life in that too, because you're around that. I mean, seldom are you painting a flat, you're painting on a flat surface, but you're not painting flat things. You're, you're painting round things on a flat surface. And I like to have that round feeling around me with a live model. Well, Greg, thank you for your time and, and thank you for your long friendship to the CM Russell Museum. You said 19 uh, Russell exhibitions and sales that you've been inv involved with. I think so. I, haven't, yeah. I don't know. Eric reminded me of that earlier, but yeah, she keeps better well, count. <laughs> that is a good run and, and we're grateful for it. Uh, we're grateful for your time and participating in this artist showcase and you know, uh, certainly we wish we could see you and all other artists in person, but I guess that'll have to wait till 2021. But we do look forward to when that day comes. Honored to be a part of the museum in any way I can, every time I can. Well, thank you, Greg. We appreciate it. We also appreciate, once again, DA Davidson Companies for their support of Art in Action. And each artist also uh, has a sponsor that in turn supports the museum. Robin Rasmussen and Pat Bird have graciously sponsored Greg Kelsey, and they in turn have supported the museum through Art in Action. So Robin and Pat, we thank you for your ongoing support and leadership to the museum as well. Uh, we thank everyone for watching this Artist Showcase. Uh, and, and Greg, you take care and we look forward to seeing you soon. Look forward to seeing you guys soon too. Thank you, take care. Bye.